Everyone here? Yeah. yeah. Distance. My name is Cal Bolle from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. And it's uh, good to be among the company of other fellow champion liberties here. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back now? Better? Yeah, All right, there we go. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Cal Bolle from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. And I'm here to talk about okay, yeah. spreading anarchy. Yeah, it's uh, pretty much some of what we do here, uh, or why we're here, or many of the reasons how we came here. And you can say, uh, I guess in regards and realizing what the state is, what the matrix is, you realize that it is a war. It's a war that you're in it, whether you like it or not. It's a war that uh, was brought upon you, right? Uh, the war on cultural and rituals and ideas and philosophy and language on everything that the state touches. Uh, so I'm going to go more into what I do for fun, spreading anarchy uh, for Richmond, Virginia, the form of uh, activism that we've been doing there as a good measure of success of talking about this, about uh, realizing that there are many would-be anarchists actually walking amongst us. And so I'll start with my background history. Um, from Bolivia, military brat. Father was in the military, so of course, if you're born on a military base like my brother in Spain, you're an American citizen. Uh, I myself was born in Kishler Air Force Base. And parents being of um, different areas of the country, as so happens when people are in the military and marry other folks. Um, my mother's from Bolivia, my mother, my father's from, uh, from here, from Philadelphia. His father was from Cuba, who escaped from a uh, Vito Castro on a dust cropper plane heading towards north with a toy compass. He knew eventually you'd reach Florida, right? Just, you know, geographically, if you look at the map. And so uh, he crashed somewhere in the Florida Keys and had a I Love Lucy story, and then I came off eventually. <laughs> uh, so Bolivia is kind of interesting, though, in that, uh, and there everyone knows it's a farce, right? You have uh, decades of history in South America, especially, being fucked over by the CIA. Uh, so it's a lot of very anti, not so much imperialist, it's a lot of distrust that comes with politics or anything that comes from the West, as they would say. So it's not a surprise all the time in which uh, the political officials there are corrupt. You know, that's, that's the uh, you know, survival of the fittest down there in, in Bolivia. You know, you want to be a politician because the first year the money is there for projects and then the rest of the years it just kind of disappears. And you know you're not going to be reelected again. So, you know, it's a one straight shot towards uh, getting a lot of uh, money, economic success. And you can bribe everyone there. So that's Bolivia, that's the background. Here in the United States, though, it's kind of different. Here in the United States, there's a sort of a trustworthiness in politics can still, you know, you ever all hear the phrase, like, is, uh, is this enacted wrong? It's still, it's just broken. That's the one that catches, you know, everyone, it's just broken. Like, you can still fix it, like, there's still, there's still ways to salvage it. Um, so that's my background, coming here to the United States, joined the military, uh, Air Force, Security Forces, and uh, met uh, some wonderful people along the way, introduced me to philosophy, and the kind of philosophy that, uh, I, I, guess, I guess, holds as a virtue uh, individualism, like uh, Anne Rand, uh, Dostoevsky's founding of good philosophy. And along that way, being stationed here in DC in the military, I came across a info shop the Brian McKinsey Info Shop in Washington, D.C. It's a place where I would imagine that all across the country there used to be many info shops. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there still are mostly bookstores, comedy bookstores. You guys want to know. Anarcho communist bookstores. I'm sure there's some in a lot of local cities. And from there, we had a, there was a great introduction towards, uh, towards anarchy. Uh, and and so, that's so much that they hated cops, right? At least we can, you know, jive with that. Uh, the, the hatred for government, the hatred for the police, that's, that's pretty cool. The hatred for capitalism, on the other hand, was uh, you know, very conflicting for me. And would be, I guess, for, I don't know, it's a, a place of poverty or a Bolivia of a lot of places who appreciates, uh, I guess, value the things that you earn and you produce and you work for. And so the hatred for capitalism never jived with me. Uh, and eventually, from Richmond, getting out of the military, I'm... Um, in the city of Richmond now, and there's a lot of uh, other groups that call themselves anarchists from there, from these info shops like uh, the Wing Nuts, the Flying Brick Library. Uh, so that's kind of the introduction, I would say, to anarchy I've had. And I think a lot of people's introduction to anarchy is when they think and hear the term, they think anarcho communist, they think Molotov cocktail throwing, uh, fanatics, uh, store breaking individuals, and that is the anarchy that I 
was always introduced to, or now again, most people commonly see anarchists as. Um, but of course, you spend some time with them, you work with them, you involve yourself with them, you try to see what kind of uh, measure of success they have towards actually achieving their abolition of the state. And the measure of success you find is how many times you can get yourself arrested, uh, how many times can you get further in cage in the cage that already exists outside of us? Uh, so no real uh, measure of success. Uh, I mean, they have food not bonds, but food charities are abundant. You know, it's not a unique thing. And that would be it. Just the measure of success and getting your merit badges of rewards and how many times you've been fucked over by the police. And so disappointment with that scene, disappointment with a lot of other groups and organizations, I think many of us can identify with trying to find an organization that meets uh, your values, uh, not so much like they have social norms that contrast you. Think maybe you could infiltrate it and turn it against itself, but that's the nature of how a lot of organizations are founded. It's very difficult to get away from those, I would say, suffocating social norms like checking your privilege or uh, just language that kind of, or, yeah, especially, yeah, I, I would say that's the major one uh, checking your privilege of all kinds, especially towards. Uh, Check your white privilege, check, uh, I would say, any kind of which way that will make the person who is more um, affected by the state uh, to be, I guess, reigning on top of those kind of non hierarchical communities that they're supposed to be. Um, but that's another tangent off where we could talk about white privilege. I'm not sure how social justice warriors these people here are or not. But, uh, but that's, that's uh, what I came across, that's what most people come across. And after many disappointments with other organizations and groups, uh, not having a good measure of success, I started a, a group with my friends in Richmond called Liberate RBA that would bring anarchism away from, well, I guess, towards, uh, towards the definition, without political rulers. Right? Not doesn't mean that sometimes we compromise with political rulers. Not doesn't mean that sometimes political rulers are okay, unless I'm your political ruler. right? or vote for me submissively for your political slave master, and versus the what the ANCOMs were putting out there. Right? So they've had over 100 years to do something with the term and the name, the symbol of anarchy, and they, don't, they didn't have much of a measure of success towards that. So we decided to, to at least try the non political route of uh, bringing a measure of success to bring anarchism to Richmond that doesn't compromise um, or the, the goal, right? Freedom. It's not uh, compromising with tyranny. It's not redefining it so your, yourself is the, the tyrant. And as you find uh, a lot of uh, means that the art of being government puts out there, uh, in terms of um, saying minimum wage, like government's bad, but we're going to advocate for government to enforce a minimum wage. And that's kind of what you find with ANCOMs. And that's pretty much what a majority of people you come across when you see anarchist acts as ANCOMs. So it's not so much that. I know there's a lot of infighting, there's a lot of uh, debate going here in terms of uh, anarcho-capitalism and what you see out there in the Facebook world. I would say the real battle is this, the marketing war against Bangkok. Uh Not to say that we can, can't talk with them, we can't uh, you know, be friends with them, but I would say that in terms of uh, what they've ruined and, and the image that they've created has been synonymous with chaos when they think of that, and that is what they advocate for. So our organization just started off as this free market anarchist be consistent with uh, the principles with the values, because that's the only way out of the matrix, to be consistent without allowing any exceptions for right, the non-aggression principle, for the NAP, for the uh, release rules. Uh, otherwise, you get a lot of weird cult and norms that come out of these uh, groups like uh, Straight Edge Movement that came out with very skinhead, neo-Nazi-like figures who have bashed their face these smoke cigarettes, right? And so, whereas they bashed by Sometimes the uh, the true intention, the meaning of the word, like uh, you know, balance your virtues and your vices, they take it to the extreme form. And the same way that anarcho communists have taken anarchy to the extreme form, and now it's very synonymous with the state. Um, so I would say that that's really been our main drive and focus in Richmond to try to separate ourselves, our unofficial marketing war against ANCOMs. And from there, uh, I would say we've succeeded. <laughs> Our war is uh, over down there in Richmond. Uh, you used to have the wing nuts, now they're planning on moving out. They're selling their house, they're trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, there's the Flying Brick Library, right? You're a very keen seeing uh, business model, I would imagine. Uh, no one's going there anymore, they shut it down their, their library, everyone's volunteering there. Two, three years ago, three or four years ago, there used to be 
Mayday parades that had like 200 people plus there. Uh, this year's was like less than 50. It's, it's dying, it's going down. And I think that's a great sign to see, uh, not just the decline of anarcho-communism, but communism. Because uh, they side with the Maoists, with the Leninists. Uh, there's, there's no exception in there. You know, they're all very buddy-buddy with that. Um, and that also we've replaced the image of anarchy there to symbolize and represent respect for private property. Uh, so we have very good business relationships with uh, nightclubs like Fallout. Uh, a restaurant, Thai Corners, uh, good food there, best crab wontons in Richmond. Uh, and reaching out towards our community and creating the anarchy that we want to see today, right? Because the question would be that we all have in our mind, you know, the state ends, what's next, right? So what's next will be also creating the free society that you've always wanted to be a part of. And I think that's uh, what I find, oh, that, that is what I found here. Um, at this festival, and I think that's uh, something very encouraging that needs to happen. That's the only way outside of the matrix. I mean, rituals can be bad and good, but rituals bring us together as a um, you know, power of the myth in terms of uh, ways that, that draws us together as a community. And our success down there is just bringing people to ritual <laughs> gatherings uh, such as these, just uh, community gatherings, freedom gatherings, inviting the question, inviting the community to come out and learn that. Uh, you know, we're not out here to break their windows, we're not out here to throw Molotov cocktails um, and present them a good definition, uh, represent, representation of what is anarchy in terms of um, everything that they pretty much already agree with. So I do spreading anarchy in Richmond, so that's pretty much entails just going out to the street, talking to my neighbors and finding out that we already share these moral precepts, these moral values against initiation of force and then universalizing that and painting the brush and the picture that government itself is the initiation of that force, uh, we come to a really good agreement. Uh, so on the Spreading Anarchy playlist, I have over 300 reported uh, interviews. A majority of them, I'll say 95% agree that yeah, the state is immoral, the government is immoral, uh, the involvement of all that, yeah, the argument makes sense, it's legit. And the only people I found, of course, that doesn't make sense with, you know, your commies, and you're sometimes minarchists. And they're very, uh, very staunch. They're very um, stubborn. They're not for for a good reason, I imagine. You know, but I think uh, the road towards anarchy is not through minarchism, not through the Libertarian Party. People say, well, what's the difference between a minarchist and an anarchist? They say six months, two years, but they forget that they start off, you know, as a Democrat or a Republican for another ten, another decade. So that's 12, 15 years. To finally get there. So, of course, people say, yeah, it's going to take forever, it's going to take some time. You know, this is the long progression of, uh, of, of life, of politics. But yeah, if you look through to political solutions for that, it will take forever. Uh, especially if you're trying to um, bring anarchy in your lifetime, you're not trying to do it by taking the political route of trying to compromise with balance. Well, you don't need a political ruler, but it's okay again if I'm your political ruler and you vote for me. Right? Uh, so at the same time, it's great in that you're trying to show them that you're not here to control the ring of men, right? to control society. Uh, you, you cast your voting ring into the Mount Doom, and you know, you, I have no idea how best your life should be run. Uh, only you yourself can determine that. And that's what's seen as a non political organization, and that's what helps a lot of people be drawn to that. Uh, I would say against when you're spreading anarchy, you look at it as you would uh, selling any product or message, right? We're selling freedom. We're not uh, converting anyone. We're not con convincing anyone. We're just presenting facts and information, right? I respect your mind, your capacity to make your decisions. I'm not here, uh, but people will say process us. But I'm just here presenting facts and evidence. That's really what we have on our side. Uh, and for a great point, we also have uh, a good common moral stance towards you know, rape, murder, theft, and assault. From right, so we start from very good foundational principles. So I would say that our market audience, to be honest, are millennials. Uh, people have not been provided a good definition of socialism and capitalism. There's a Rupert report uh, by Reason.com that came out. It's like it's very difficult for them for to understand it, and, and that's you know it should be a good thing for us, but it's a horrible thing to so you know the areas of how government indoctrinates uh, the youth into not seeing the world come freely as it should be, not seeing the truth and mixing up their definitions. Um, so I would say that's our target audience. That's how we've been successful in Richmond, is reaching out, although they have more time to study, you could say, right? They have more youth time to develop, and now all that time, older generations have, uh, you know, still taking care of families. Uh, I'll do Q&A very shortly. Now, this is going to be fun. 
Uh, so that's uh, been our measure of success this recent not doing these spreading anarchy videos and finding that as actually we already agree with the precepts of morality against initiation of force. Uh, we just never really knew that other people really felt the same way until we you know, started talking to one another. And these rituals that we share right now as a community at this festival is very, very much important. It's not like a magician trick where you show them that you know the state doesn't exist and you know here's the facts of evidence and then you just leave them dumbfounded, right? You need to draw them in. You need to um, show them what anarchy is like for you, right? You're you're an ambassador. You're a salesperson. You're um, you're, you're you are anarchy, and all that is very important to help one another escape the end of the state. It doesn't mean that we have to convert everyone or talk to everyone or reach out to everyone. Uh, it just means that you found a place to call your home and you'll like your neighbors to, you know, when the state ends, respect your private property, right? <laughs> respect uh, that you claim ownership over your body, over your property, over your money. Um, you know, when the state ends and that's inevitable, uh, what we do now to them is very important during the transition and trying to reach out to many people is also just as important. And the great thing about that is that you don't have to convince or talk to everyone, right? Uh, but they said the revolution in every war was three percenters, right? Not that many people. I mean, they're conditioned otherwise to follow the lead or follow the bandwagon effect, but you don't have to convince everyone or talk to everyone. Just start off with your own interpersonal relationships and reach out to the community, and um, it starts right after that, it starts blowing up after that. I mean, a lot of friends is doing that, and uh, we're looking forward to sharing a very similar like setting here in Virginia called Anarchon, and that will be in two weeks. Um, so yeah, I look forward to doing a lot more with this with all of you and spreading anarchy across the country, <laughs> and especially here again. This and is around uh, the world. Yeah, around the world, absolutely, absolutely. Anarchon with an N. Yeah, Anarchon. Okay, so yeah, like um, sure it wasn't an M because that would be confusing. <laughs> right, right, right. It's like like Otakon, like like those little. <laughs> uh, buddy, my panda came up with the name. We're trying to figure out like what would we call it, uh, but Anarchon makes sense, so it kind of works out. There's actually a group in Australia, you know, doing some research, like who hasn't come up with that name already? But some Ancoms did a couple years ago, long ago, but they didn't secure the .com name, and so it was never wrote anywhere. And then, of course, you read the comments <laughs> of what happened to that conference, a lot of brilliant end battles and loss of interest, and kind of the same thing that happens to a lot of comic groups. It's with the whole check of privilege thing. I think it's, uh, it's horrible. It uh, pushes people in the corners, shames them, kills them. It's, those social norms, I think, are a result of not having any real solutions towards any of the states, so at least try to alleviate some of the pain on each other and, and then start self cannibalizing after that. But, uh, but that's spreading anarchy. I uh, have a lot of pamphlets, a lot of flags there on the table there. Uh, we've done a lot of collaboration here uh, as well in terms of uh, producing some of the pamphlets for volunteerism. So, uh, Katie, I think she's here. I think maybe I saw her drive here. Okay. Yeah, Katie is here. Um... Yeah, well, so, yeah, so she helped write some of that too. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have a good, uh, I guess, alliance here. So that's been a lot of fun. So with that, that's uh, spreading anarchy. And uh, if you find any information over there useful, that'd be that's great. If you want to start uh, your own liberate chapter wherever you're at, or help liberate uh, your city, <coughs> contact me. I'm very easy to reach out to and uh, start working on uh, talking about anarchy. Uh, there's, I have a very good method in introducing that and. Later this evening, you guys want to do a one-on-one -on -one and talk about that? That will be fun too. And so, if you guys have any Q&As, I think you had a... So, if you have questions, um, if you want to come up and, and grab a microphone so that we can get this on our, on our YouTube... Um, sure. Everything that goes to the microphone is the audio for the uh, video. Um, so, I guess my... First question is, uh, I see a lot of uh, negative arguments on the internet, on Facebook, on any of the social media, and a lot of times when I see anarchists interact with non, well, with status, I think that at some point there's a better way to interact. Uh, I think that there's a better way to sell our message and I don't see that being sold by a lot of anarchists and it concerns me because I think the, the more we spread our message in a positive way, in a positive light, the more that we're going to see returns on our investment, if you will. 
And I just wondered what you thought about that and your message of spreading anarchy. How are you trying to make it more inclusive or I don't know what the right word is, but right, I, right. I, I guess that's it. That's where I'm going. I, I'm looking to sell the message of anarchy from a moral perspective. And I think that I do that quite well, but I got to be honest, I take a softball approach. And I'm wondering what approach you guys are taking in Richmond, for instance, to, to, to make that message. Right. No, I think that's a, that's a really good question. In terms of like, again, selling any product or talking about anything, if you look very stressed out or you're talking about it, it doesn't look like it's a fun thing, right? Yeah. If you're cursing all the time, it's like, I don't think I want to be part of that organization or that group. Uh, Especially if they're always being very trollish, it's like, well, you know, you know, what's them, you know, what's, what's, what do I have any reason to to look into that or invest my time with that, right? And uh, so you, you kind of have to balance it out with uh, celebration of life, celebration of these kind of community gatherings, you celebrate the the positiveness. Uh, it is again a lot of negative stuff that's going out there, but you kind of have to balance, I guess, that humanitarian or what they call it now brutalist approach, and find a, a medium in between the two. Uh, but in terms of like online, why you see it often, I think it's just uh, an expression of uh, desperation, loneliness. It's uh, difficult for a lot of people to connect with other anarchists in real life. So of course, if you're hiding, if you're behind a computer screen, uh, you lose a lot of the uh, connections you have with a real human person, right? Most of communication is nonverbal, 90% of it. So right off the bat, there's a lot that's information that's being missing that's not being digested properly to see where you're coming from or what you're conveying. And I think the just focusing solely through the internet loses a lot of that, uh, loses that connection. So yeah, you have a lot of uh, anger issues that comes out of that. And I think that's pretty much where a lot of it, I guess, the trollish behavior and stuff like that comes from. But going back to what you're, you're saying in the positive view, yeah, that's the best way to talk about anything, right? <laughs> um, so I, I agree, I, I think the, the the trollless message that you're talking about, I, I see a lot of that, and you know, I, mean, I see a lot of like attack of specific things that we probably disagree with, like veterans and, and things like that. And I see that the way that we attack these people, I think it doesn't necessarily bring them in, right? Right? And there's just there's a there's a message the way there's a way to sell our message with love, and there's a way to sell our message with hate. And if we sell our message with hate, we're going to fall short on a lot of uh, a lot of people. But I think if we turn that message around to uh, to say, hey, hey, look, here, here's how we're reaching out to these people, and we're doing it in a positive and loving way. I mean, the truth is, I'm a veteran. I didn't know at 17 what I know now. Um, I'm a lot smarter than I was at 17, <laughs> right. and I'm quite happy for that. If I wasn't smarter, then it means I wouldn't have grown, uh, and I think a lot of times uh, I see anarchists take very self-righteous positions and attack people, and I think it drives them away instead of pulling them in. Right, I would say uh, just be an asshole to assholes, right? And that's yeah. not really too many people out there, but for the most part, yeah, uh, reach out as you would uh, someone talking to you or trying to introduce something to you, you know, how would you talk to that person? How would you convey yourself? Uh, for the same reason, like you don't get angry if a kid accidentally bumps into you, right? You know, they just didn't know. Uh, for a lot of this information, that a lot of status, uh, they don't know a lot of the stuff that's going on. You know, so you have to give that benefit of a doubt and see how they respond once they are presented with the information, with the facts and the evidence, and see what their choices are after that. But uh, if you introduce the argument, though. Uh, I have a very easy three simple question process. You'll find that people do readily agree with it. They find, yeah, we're on the same page. Uh, in versus if you come out them, uh, you know, you're a fucking status or, you know, uh, it's like, oh, you're, you're, so, so, you're a welfare troop uh, and all these other areas. Yeah, you're not going to bring anyone in. Uh, it looks very stressed out. Uh, and again, that's. Uh, when, when people go that far, it usually seems as a recognition uh, of feeling that you can't talk to anyone about this. And so you turn very misanthropic, you turn to another Doug Casey where he goes out there and calls these people monkeys. Uh, so you know he puts himself in a very high lofty position uh, at the expense of everyone else because he has some information that they don't, they don't know or it's hard for, for the, difficult for them to understand. Um, 
But I think that's really been what's been lacking with anarchy for a long time, trying to find rich and imaginative ways to communicate these ideas uh, through non-political means. I think for a while we can show that it hasn't worked. The Libertarian Party since 1971, decades of no measure of success. In Virginia, Sarvis gained uh, 6%, 6%. You know, after 40 years, it's like, you know, that great, yeah, I'll die a slave. Uh, so let's go all the way with consistency, and I'll, you'll find a great measure of success in that in reaching out to our communities, reaching out to would-be anarchists, if only you approach them the way, same way that you would wish that someone approached you and talked to you about these sort of topics, right? It's not with uh, malicious intent or to put you down or shame you, put you in a corner. It's like, that's not going to go anywhere. It's, um, it never does go anywhere, except more cannibalizing in this uh, to a hurtful place. How are you guys attracting people in Virginia, Cal? So I have a, a sign that says, ask me how government is immoral. Uh, very, it's a simple sign. So it asks me how government is immoral, and I just uh, stand out there in my city, and people come up to me you know, out of humor, out of uh, curiosity. That's the best place to start, right? They're not, I'm not saying, hey, debate me. Uh, I'm not saying uh, you know, your ideas are fucked. I'm just uh, asking the question, and people come up to you, and they start the conversation from there. So I start off with uh, three simple questions when I talk to them. And the same like boxing has rules. Before we box, you know, let's establish what the rules are and then what the consequences are. And so the same thing you want to do when you talk to people about these, uh, you, you set up the precept with the questions. And the questions are all the same questions. It's pretty much in your day-to-day -day life, do you use violence to solve your personal problems? And most people will say, yeah, I, I don't. Some people may hesitate because they don't have a good definition of the term, right? That's that's government schools for you, but you need to provide them a good concrete definition. Violence will be defining as uh, placing a person in an involuntary position without their consent or choice, i.e. rape, murder, theft, and assault. And everybody agrees, yeah, that's wrong. And then the other questions are the same from there. So it's just pretty much, <laughs> I don't want to go through the whole process. I have videos on it, it's very lengthy. Uh, I mean, it's fast elevator talk, once you do it after a while, but it's very successful. You can get a lot of people to come to that understanding. And then uh, I think the approach that we do is just, yeah, just reaching out to one another and uh, inviting the question, inviting the discussion. And you'll find very readily that people already agree that government is immoral and that they would advocate for a free community that is consensual once you have these conversations. I would say setting up the conversation, though, is very important. Uh, otherwise, it can go all over the place, right? If you don't have good, clear definitions from the starting point, yeah, the conversation was just, I'm pretty sure we've all had these conversations, just trying to talk anarchy in the middle of like a mid-sentence or mid-conversation or, or any kind of a setting, and it goes all over the place. You have to, you're going from you know, left to right, you know, trying to answer all these different questions. Um, if you set it up, uh, I, was, I wouldn't say correctly, if you, there's a great way to set it up, to finally come to a position where the person is just acting out of curiosity, and you know, that makes sense. Uh, who will provide the roads? Well, you know, businesses already build the roads already. It's like, oh, you know, I already agree that taxation is immoral. I already agree that government is a monopoly on services you and I want. Uh, have a good understanding. Everything else, and having providing this factual evidence, comes very easy after that. Um, and as a result, we have over 100 anarcho capitalists in Richmond. Uh, as a result, uh, it's just a great measure of success. My, my mother is an anarchist, my sister. Uh, yeah. It's uh, like my, my best friend. Thank you for your service. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So you can talk to anyone about this stuff. It doesn't have, it's not, it doesn't have to be that difficult. Um, and again, you know, there's some people who might be difficult with, and I just kind of found them to just be your local commies. And, uh, you know, go figure. You know, don't waste so much time in trying to convey those uh, violent sociopaths, right? Don't try to, you know, that 10 hours you could have used uh, trying to debate that commie, you could have used in, you know, introducing the conversation, the most important conversation in the world, freedom to, to like 20 other people, right? You know, efficiency is good. You know, put the capitalism towards the anarcho part, right? Uh, and marketing that and doing this as most efficient way we can, I think we can beat the whole idea of, well, the difference between an anarchist and a minarchist is six months. Like, no, the difference between an anarchist and a status is this one fun conversation. And it happened just like that. And I have a lot of friends just on day one. It's like, that's legit. That's, uh, you know, sounds consistent. All right, that makes sense. Cool. <laughs> uh, nice. I'm an anarchist. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I think uh, we could do much better than the old model. And I think it's great to be here amongst a lot of people who advocate universally with their principles, with a room full of integrity, uh, especially towards peaceful parenting, right? <laughs> that's, uh, that's a huge one. And it's, it's great to be uh, amongst other fellow champions of liberty here. Um, if there's no other questions. Uh, oh, we have more questions, okay. Hi, um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, as someone that's, I've only been an anarchist less than a year now, and um, I've kind of used the approach, because I've converted my, most of my family to libertarianism, and I've kind of used more of the incremental approach, but since I'm more, I'm not quite as experienced with the, with, with the anarchy as others, um, is there, do you have training videos or anything like that, right, as a resource I could... Yeah, <laughs> because I, I, it's hard for me to make the jump to right. convince people to go cold. I think I'm much better at slowly showing them the way. But if, you, you kind of talk about just making the leap from you know status to right to um, straight to anarchy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, where could I go to find more about? Uh, that? I have uh, an old YouTube channel called Renegade Boy Scout. I have flyers on there that I'll point you to the direction. I have. Uh, over close to 300 recorded individual interviews that show the entire process, best way to kind of condense the information. Sometimes they're elevator talks, right? You know, the person's just trying to, trying to have a good understanding, so you're just planting the idea. But they get it, they agree. It's like, all right, yeah, uh, the government is immoral, understand that. And then so you provide them more information to meet up later to talk more about. And I would say, I mean, Eventually, you do this after a while. It's kind of like uh, if you guys play any RPG games, you gain like 10 experience points, 15 experience points. Uh, you keep doing this, you'll level up, and you'll be very good at uh, being a status whisperer. And uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, but if it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, that's all you're really doing. Here are the facts. Here are the evidence. Uh, here's a uh, community of the people who respect that. That's your house. That's your property. That's your money. That's your body. Uh, I'm not here to claim ownership over any of that, right? I respect. Uh, which, which I have a duty to uh, to respect that, and uh, we can start from there. So yeah, I have a lot of videos you can look at. We have uh, that's usually why I record it to show. Firstly, a lot of the common complaints I have is like, well, I get it. What about everyone else? Like, well, they're not going to get it. It's like, well, here's uh, 300 other videos of other people getting it and agreeing with you right here in the same city. You know, so if that was their only last evading fear, you know, hopefully that could be well arrested now. And also the. Since I can't be over this video, I should show how to go about in having these discussions. But again, it's like uh, anything else. You'll, you'll find a way to, to introduce a new term, a new, new way to convey an idea. And so in Richmond, we just go back and forth and uh, smith through the entire process trying to find a good, efficient way to, to, talk, about, uh, to talk about this. It doesn't have to take forever. I think menarchism is the, uh, the pothole to the road of freedom. And I think we can provide better directions to avoid yeah. that pothole and go straight to the finish line. And I, I think uh, given that information, that's we're, we should, we have to. It's not like if we see someone choking in a restaurant, it's like you've given the directions, they'll figure it out. It's like, you do it. I, I know how to do this, right? Uh, the state is immoral. The state is uh, bad. You know? uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say, well, sometimes, you know, maybe incremental. Just go, go, go all the way. It's uh, what gave him information that you would give your own brother, right? You wouldn't short sell him. You wouldn't tell him uh, any lies or mislead him. You would tell him the straight, hard, cold truth, right? This is what's going on. Right, uh, and you need him to survive. You need him to excel, and he can only do that if he's provided with that those, those facts and that information. Uh, so look at it as that too. And uh, I think there's a lot of credit to a lot of people. I would say in and having these conversations, these important conversations, they're not as cheap as a lot of people think they are. They just never knew. They just haven't been provided any of this information. So we can do it a much better approach, and just going straight to the core of the message, going to the finish line. And uh, and see what happens after that. You know, give that a try. Okay. All right. I'm actually kind of curious about, like, when you mentioned what happens after that. So you have, like, I, I've seen a lot of your videos. Yeah. And you have hundreds of these encounters on the street, <laughs> and they're like, you know, it's like five minutes, ten minutes, whatever. And somebody comes to a realization like that, and so, I guess my concern in that sort of encounter is that that could be somebody could have that aha moment, sort of like, yeah, I I, I agree with that. But just to kind of compartmentalize it as you know, just a philosophical understanding how that transfers into the rest of their life or something that stays with them after they leave the conversation. Mm -hmm. I know you have like really pretty good recruitment rates. You have like 100 people in, our, in uh, Richmond RBA. And so like, what do you do to bridge that gap between like the people that are sort of forming that community there that you, that you speak of and then these encounters where you have these sort of like conversions, you know, so to speak, 
on a street? Like, what? How do you lead people from, you know, there? Do you sort of give them information where they can learn more and just let them go, or how do you? We could do that. Yeah. You know, how do you do it? I mean, it's what, uh, you know, it's or what happens after that encounter? Or after the encounter, I give them information uh, to contact me to uh, to meet up again. Uh, yeah. I would say recorded interviews, probably 300 recorded yeah. ones. Uh, off camera, another maybe four or 500. I probably talked like strictly about anarchy to over like, 1,500 people in Richmond now, uh, and I just invite them to have the conversation. Um, you know, I'm an open book. I, I, I work from home, so I have a lot of free time for people to come over and ask questions. So that's pretty much what you want to do is, like, not just like once you have the conversation. Hey, uh, I'm throwing a party uh, later this month. Should come, right? Uh, I, that helps a lot. That that draws in the community. That draws like even if you have some questions. Here's a place for you to go, right? We're not. Mm -hmm. Like magician trying to sweep the rug and then you trip and fall. It's like there's no state and then versus everyone else. Uh, you know, it's you have to draw that. That's the community you want to. That's your future friend. That's your future fellow champion of liberty. You know, help uh, draw them as you would uh, yourself. And most most of us looking for a place to belong. Most of us looking for an organization with consistent values. Um, we find it here. You know, help them uh, show show the way towards here. Uh, you know, they'd be even more grateful that you show them earlier, <laughs> right, rather than much later. Uh, so that's what we uh, what we do in Richmond. We have monthly gatherings, so we have monthly parties. Uh, now we have like uh, bi-weekly discussions where we talk community events, topics of uh, importance or casualness. Um, so the couch episodes. Yeah, the couch episodes, right. Uh, to show that we can have these conversations in person, right? It doesn't have to be only online. Uh, to show that there's uh, anarchists that you can find in your own community and have these conversations. Uh, they're, they're, they're a lot of fun, especially in person. I mean, we could do uh, the Skype and Google Plus and all that stuff is fun, but we should also be encouraging to reach out towards our neighbors, uh, you know, to, to bring the to bridge that gap and grow it more. Um, having these these freedom festivals you guys are hosting is like the best thing you can do. If even if you don't do like a monthly gathering, it's difficult. But having an annual flagship place where we all can just get together, that's that's amazing. That's beautiful. Uh, we're finally at a position now to do that in Richmond. So. Uh, you know, a lot of people have conflicting various schedules, so having an, an annual date like this is, is perfect. I mean, this, this will only continue to grow. Uh, it can't go backwards. It will never shrink. Uh, this will increase exponentially. Uh, and it grows the faster that you help, help it grow, right? This is your baby. You know, nurture, nurture your free society. Uh, you know, have a good vetting system and just uh, reach out to one another, and this will, will get there, right, from the inside out. Um, ostracize the state and create that free society that uh, you know should belong <laughs> where it should be and that uh, is you know what kind of would we do then I guess so it's presenting a lot of information I could uh, tailor a lot of the information to like your local city and whatnot too so that way you know they contact Zeke right mm -hmm. you're curious about philosophy you're curious about a piece of parenting um, I meet here you know at this cafe once a month you know let's hang out and eventually people will come uh, people will see that the consistency of you putting that out there it's like eh, I don't know maybe eventually I'll check it out and so I've had a lot of people say you know I've been walking by you're asking me how government is a moral sign for like a couple of months now it's like all right I gotta know <laughs> and uh, so I get a lot of those and then become really good friends after that uh, and I was like yeah, I've been waiting for you so uh, just putting yourself out there consistently is what's going to bring it in and uh, I think what you guys are doing here has uh, helped a lot I think to bring all of us together here it's brought me here um, so I think we're excited uh, to have you. <laughs> me too, Joe. And so yeah, that, that helps a lot. It's uh, remember we're not a community of assholes, right? You know, we unplug from Facebook every once in a while and Reddit and 4chan, you know, and you know we want to create a community of people that care and generally, uh, you know, want to see a free society, want real freedom, you know. So use that and uh, exhibit yourself. Use that as an extension of yourself um, to convey your message. Sometimes even online, right? So. With that, um, yeah, community, show what that looks like, and they'll come, they'll see that. And it's like, well, no one's here is telling me to check my privilege. I guess it's okay, right? Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's spreading anarchy. That's my workshop. But uh, any last questions? I got some poured wine. Yeah. What's the check your privilege? I hear that all the time. I never really got into it. But go ahead, talk to mm. me. Uh, mind this whole idea of check your privilege. privilege. Go ahead. All right, all right, so I would say when someone tells you to check your privilege, they're trying to uh, tie you in, strap you down, rope you in, handcuff you to the collective history of people of your similar pigment of your color skin, of uh, your gender, what's between your legs. All right, it's, it's generalization, it's yeah, collectivism, it's communism. And, but the thing is, 
where it comes from is a way to trick people into believing that you can still fix government. So they'll say, well, you need to check your privilege because you don't get pulled over as often as uh, Latinos or black people, right? So you have a special sense of privilege in which the police extortionists treat you kinder, right? It's the wrong as a way. Right, uh, right. You know, and and that, that is the right approach, wrong, right. Dude, come on. Right, so in all the textbooks you'll see in like checking your privilege, they'll say, well, um, they'll try to convey the idea like there's a, a large population that are prejudiced, being racist against, being treated ill, wrong, a lot of minorities, and, and it's being wronged by our social, our social institutions, namely the criminal justice system and the juvenile detention system. But it's a bang, you just tell me what the problem is, the state. Right? The state is being prejudiced. The state is being racist. The state is being this biased organization. It's not me. Right? It's because uh, extortionists uh, treat me differently than you. I, I advocate for their abolishment. I want that to end. But of course, they never teach you this in these university classes to abolish the criminal justice system, that you can't have a polycentric legal system. You only have to have one. So they have to provide band-aid solutions to the problem. And that's what uh, easy, uh, white privilege is all about. Band-aid solutions to to these problems and trying to, trying to stop. Instead of looking at, examining the whole thing, uh, not trying to keep weeding it, but to unearth it from the ground, you know, root it up, and uh, finding the common denominator of all our social problems and ills is the state. And that's what should be abolished, and not finding sugarcoating excuses or band-aids. Is that a good uh, white privilege? Yeah? <laughs> all right. <laughs> so it's a distraction. Uh, it, yeah, as anything else, just to divide. This entire conversation has gone on to this whole event, this festival, just continue it, you know. I don't know, I guess there's a time limit, but still. Yeah. I, as long as I like to keep the conversation going, so. No, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, like, I had a thing where I always wanted, like, to find terms. You mentioned that earlier. Right. I'm always like, like there's so many terms that's being used. Or, <laughs> There's so many terms that are being used around here, uh, you know, I mean, in events like this that bring in, and then there are these terms too again, anarchist, voluntarist, right. capitalist, and then anarcho, whatever, you just put after it, but, you know, like, why don't you just stop after anarcho, because either way, it's anarcho, it's anarchy, it's all essential, you know, so, okay, there's just a particular way, a style that you prefer, okay. Right. Either way, it's all consensual, so what's the argument about then for it? If everything's consensual, it's what's better? Oh, okay. You know, oh, well, maybe. But right. anyways, um, definitions like then with capital, what is capital? Let's get that clear. What is property? Right. What is religion? And what is government? What is state? Oh, these, these, the most popular words you hear in these circles that, especially among debates that have disagreements, like ANCOM and ANCOP debate, there's always going on, right. there's always discrimination. Yeah. I believe it's a, a misunderstanding of terms. I, I would say, yeah, I'm, there's most agreements in the market communists, we just mean different things, we, mean, we use different words. Their socialism is uh, what I would see, corporatism, my corporatism is their socialism, vice versa, and all the way around. Uh, it's a different language, but at the same time, when you look at it uh, efficiently, how you want to use your time and energy and resources efficiently, uh, use it to those who have never been introduced to anarcho-communism and those distracting terms of definition. Introduce it to someone who has not been, uh, I won't say corrupted, yeah, corrupted by language. I mean, that's what public school is. They teach you corrupt language. They don't right. teach you how to, right, they don't teach you objective definitions. Uh, so starting off with definitions and terms yeah. and defining them is very important. Uh, that allows no exceptions. That allows no one to bastardize the message. That allows no one to uh, make exceptions for violence. Uh, to universalize it, uh, as you would integrity itself is the way to go and, and bring about real freedom. Uh, and those that try to warp it and create exceptions are only trying to do it for their own personal gain, uh, you know, to rule over others, right? That's why they're always looking to find uh, exceptions to the rules. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the best way to go, uh, and I found that to be like, the foundational way to talk to people. You start off with the definition in terms, and you can get to that better place.